Did I ever rule on that issue? You said that you would do it later as it came Okay, up. well, here's the thing. Later is now. I got a jury in a box, so you could have asked me that an hour. I mean, we had time this morning. I could have gone through that this morning and made clarity on it for both sides. So I wish that the court would just follow their own instruction. Well, I, I'll follow my instructions when you all bring to my attention what you need to in a timely manner. Day one of the Young Thug criminal trial was smooth sailing, went off without a hitch. I'm just kidding. It was a bit of a mess. We're going to dive into seven developments from the start of this major RICO case. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Well, folks, we are finally here. The first day in the Young Thug RICO trial out in Georgia. Pretty unbelievable, right? I mean, almost a year of jury selection. We did a sidebar previously about all the twists and turns in this case. The jurors, the attorneys, the defendants all getting in trouble with the court. Nine defendants took plea deals. One defendant still on the run. Twelve defendants' cases were severed from the rest. And after all of this, this trial has now begun for six defendants. And that includes rapper Young Thug, real name Jeffrey Lamar Williams. Now, he and his co-defendants are charged under Georgia's RICO or Racketeering Act, namely that they are all part of this criminal enterprise, that they're engaged in murder, robbery, assault, and so forth. Young Thug himself, he faces eight charges, and he is considered by prosecutors to be the leader of this criminal enterprise. And according to prosecutors, that criminal enterprise or gang is known as YSL or Young Slime Life. Now, the prosecutors allege that Young Thug started YSL back in 2012. It's also known as Young Stoner Life and is the name of the artist's music label. But now we are in day one. Actually, I should tell you, we started an hour late because a juror had car trouble. But as you'll see, that wasn't the only delay in court. Oh, no, 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 no. And the start of this trial, what do we always have? We have opening statements, right? The opportunity for each side to lay out their case for the jury. This came after the judge provided jury instructions. Okay, so let's start this up. And of course, we're going to start with the prosecution. It's their burden. It's their case. So we hear from Fulton County Chief Deputy District Attorney Adrian Love. And I got to first highlight how she started off her opening statement with a poem. Now, this is the law of the jungle. As old and as true as the sky. And the wolf that shall keep it may prosper, but the wolf that shall break it must die. As the creeper that girdles the tree trunk, the law running forward and back, for the strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the path. Well, that's right. A little Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book for you. Unique way to start off a criminal trial. The idea, of course, is that YSL operated as a pact. And that's going to be an important theme in this case, right? That the actions taken by the YSL members was not to benefit themselves as individuals, but rather the collective gang with Williams at the top. That's how you prove the main reeker of her opening statement. And what I expect the evidence to show in this case is that YSL, the group made up of the defendants sitting before you today, along with other both indicted and unindicted co-conspirators, the group calling itself Young Slime Life, dominated, dominated the Cleveland Avenue community of Fulton County. They created a crater in the middle of Fulton County's Cleveland Avenue community that sucked in the youth, the innocence, and even the lives of some of its youngest members. Young Slime Life came about and consisted of three or more people when it began. Three or more people who were willing to and who did commit criminal street gang activity, that is crimes, that were intended to further the purposes and advance the directives of YSL itself. 
So YSL, as the evidence will show, they didn't move individually. The members and associates of YSL, they moved like a pack. With the defendant Jeffrey Williams as his head. Their members commit crimes on behalf of the gang. They commit crimes such as armed robbery, hijacking, motor vehicle theft, theft by receiving, stolen firearms, so many stolen firearms, possession of a machine gun, and narcotic sales. And last but certainly not least, murder. You're going to hear that this gang stole at least three lives from this community over the last 10 years. At least three that are referenced in this indictment. You'll find that as a result of this gang's activities, a young woman who had nothing to do with either YSL or any of their opposition was gunned down by people trying to get back at YSL for what they did. You'll hear evidence that after the murder of Donovan Thomas, no less than 50 shootings occurred over the course of the next several months. Now that is part of her opening statement, laying out what all of this means, and it kind of gives you a summary. But what Love also did was she took the time to explain what RICO is. What is RICO? Racketeer, Influenced, and Corrupt Organizations. And the reason she did this is because RICO cases are very complicated. We know most of them when we talk about the mafia, but they've been applied to other collective criminal enterprises too. So Love focused in on her opening statement with highlighting how there was an unspoken agreement between the defendants, an agreement to break the law, steal things, commit crimes, exert dominance and control through this pattern of illegal activity. There's no written contract or bylaws. It's rather an unspoken agreement. And in order to prove a racketeering conspiracy, you not only need an agreement, but you also need overt acts to further that conspiracy. And this trial will show what those overt actions or steps or things are that were done to further the criminal conspiracy. I believe there are 191 overt acts that prosecutors are going to try to prove in this case. By the way, those overt acts, they don't necessarily need to be crimes, by the way. They could be a phone call or flashing a hand sign or a conversation. That's what prosecutors are going to do in this case. Now, during the prosecution's opening is when we saw the first signs of trouble. I mean, I wasn't expecting this trial to run like a well-oiled machine after everything we've seen so far. But this drama started right at the beginning. Love's opening statement had to be stopped. And their actions during the dates that are listed in this indictment are what we are asking that you pay close attention to and you evaluate. Your Honor. Do you have an objection? Yes, sir. Basis? Motion. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of our breaks. I'm going to need to probably put, ask you to retire to your headquarters at your deliberation room, and we'll call you back in just a minute. All right, Mr. Steele, what's your, what's your motion, sir? Your Honor, last week, two weeks, three weeks ago, you ordered the parties to share all of their displays in opening statement to the others so we don't have to have these interruptions. I did that. The state shared with me four attachments. That's all they had. That's what I got. What you just saw on your screen, if you don't remember, I'll ask the state to put it up and I asked for it to be marked as exhibit, is what you already excluded. It states that Mr. Ryan was convicted of murder, and I represent the co-defendant who's not on trial on the appeal. How did that not get sent to me so I could bring it to the Sambo Court's attention? One. And two, how do we just violate court orders? So, yes, I have a serious motion for a mistrial because it's intentional misconduct. Yeah. Okay. So, Brian Steele, who represents Young Thug, Mr. Williams, says Love just showed slides that he never saw, and there was something in her slide that wasn't supposed to be in there. Namely, that he's representing Rodalius Ryan in another case. The jury shouldn't have seen that. Says this is grounds for a mistrial. The jury can't unsee what they saw. Well, Judge Ural Glanville, 
He denied the motion and he said, look, I'll provide an instruction to the jury that will correct the record. Seems fine, right? Not so simple because then other defense attorneys stood up and said they noticed there were mistakes in the state's PowerPoint. All right, Mr. Matthews. Yes, the quote in the indictment is different from the quote in the PowerPoint. So that's two errors in slide 15 pertaining to Mark Wade's view. In the state's opening presentation, the date they have is October 1, 2020. But in the indictment, that particular overt act is November 16, 2020. So that's a, a third error in the uh, state's opening uh, slide presentation. So those need to be corrected to mirror the indictment. On behalf of Mr. Stillwell, um, slide number 47, um, it suggests that Mr. Stillwell is still committing crimes on behalf of the gang even after being indicted on these charges. And my understanding was that anything that you had not ruled upon, we were not supposed to uh, reference or discuss in opening statements. So those are clear references to um, unindicted charges that we did not get a ruling on its admissibility yet. Do I have any further objections? Are there any further objections to the state's PowerPoint? Your Honor, I was unaware that there were changes. I apologize. No one told me that I didn't get an email to that or text. I told you all to do that during lunch. That was my last conversation with you all before I went ahead and broke for lunch. You know, you all don't listen to the court, and, I'm, and it's going to get you all in a lot of hot water. You need to listen to me when I tell you something. And don't rely upon your own understanding. These jurors are waiting back there. We are dallying out here. So, you didn't follow my instructions, Mr. Steele. I, I mean, that's what I asked you all to do. I asked you all to share each We're already behind to begin with. Any further objections? And on slide 10 and 13, they misquoted the Instagram post. I get, they misquoted them? Yes, they did. It says, I bet YSL make the news tonight. That's not what the Instagram post says. Your Honor, we actually copied the Instagram post into slides 10 and 13. And it does not say tonight. I'm sorry. Okay. Your Honor, I don't have anything else to add. I think we're going to move on. I will take out the word tonight. He's right. Oh, boy. So Judge Glanville, clearly upset. The jurors are waiting. Judge Glanville actually said at one point that one of the attorneys was hijacking his bench by bringing up an issue at the 11th hour. You have the various defense attorneys. They're saying they didn't get the appropriate copies of the state's presentation, but they also didn't apparently follow the judge's instructions on how to review the state's PowerPoint for any issues during the court break. But there were apparently mistakes in the presentation to begin with. So at one point, Judge Glanville gets so fed up, he threatens that no one now and use PowerPoints in their opening statements. But defense attorneys are like, we did nothing wrong. We sent our PowerPoints over to the state well in advance, and we need them. We're not prepared. So finally, in the end, the judge did allow edited, redacted versions of the slides and PowerPoints. And after over two hours, the jury finally came back in to hear the continuation of the opening statements. This is day one, folks. Okay, my opinion, just a mess. Just a mess. Not unexpected when you're dealing, though, with six defendants, multiple charges, RICO, over 100 overt acts. This trial is scheduled to last three to six months. Could it be longer? I don't know. But let's go back to Prosecutor Love. So she continues on with her opening statement after this very long break. And here is where she focuses again on the leader of this alleged criminal enterprise, Jeffrey Williams or Young Thug. The evidence is going to show that the defendant, Jeffrey Williams, words and actions also betray his participation in the conspiracy. He rented a car, which happened to be a silver Infinity sedan, that other YSL members, among them, Diamante Kendrick and Shannon Stilwell, 
used when they openly and notoriously gunned down Donovan Thomas on January the 10th of 2015. I expect yet another YSL associate will come in here and tell you that Jeffrey Williams paid the money, gave the money to go to Miami and lay low in the wake of the Donovan Thomas murder. To Vikyan Garlington, who isn't before you for your consideration today, but who is in fact a YSL associate and co-conspirator of these defendants. He posted a video of the defendant, Jeffrey Williams, looking into the camera and saying these words. So, I think a lie to their mama, lie to their kids, lie to their brothers and sisters, and then get right into the courtroom and tell the God's honest truth. Don't get it. Y'all need to get killed, bro. That's from me and YSL. The defendant's words tell you that there is an enterprise. Okay, next in Prosecutor Adrian Love's opening statement in day one of the Young Thug Rico trial. She moves on to this controversial piece of evidence in this case, rap lyrics, specifically Williams and co-defendant Diamante Kendrick's lyrics, to be precise. Now, the judge previously ruled that 17 sets of lyrics can be used as evidence. Now, this didn't come without a lot of blowback from First Amendment advocates and defense attorneys. Does this stifle or violate someone's freedom of speech and artistic expression? It's a fair question. I mean, there's already been criticism that rap lyrics in general are predominantly used against black defendants in trials. But Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis, who is overseeing this prosecution, has said, quote, I believe in the First Amendment. It's one of our most precious rights. However, the First Amendment does not protect people from prosecutors using lyrics as evidence if it is such. And that idea was echoed by Prosecutor Love when she told the jury that they weren't chasing the lyrics. They were chasing the murders and found the lyrics. Lyrics that have an uncanny similarity to very true and very real and quite specific events, as the evidence will show. Jeffrey Williams' words that he promotes through songs with beats behind them, they aren't random. He tells you as the evidence will show. Take this to trial. I rep my life for real. For slimes, you know I kill. Trial, I done beat it twice, Kendrick. I'm undefeated like feds came and snatched me. I don't know, no point in asking. I was on what? Believe it. Stuck like a magnet. I shoot at your man and need to stand down. I up my stamina, take it to trial. Get an appeal, take it to trial. Yeah, you gon' whack him. Pay for that casket, that's just if we whack him. My young <laughs> pulling up. Bentleys, Austin Martins, Rares and Teslas, strapped with an FN. You're gonna hear a lot about their things. Watch me whack that <laughs> Pop him like a cyst. Glock with the assist. Incidentally. The gun at the home of Jeffrey Williams on May of 2022 that had been modified with that switch, it was a block. He tells you, we committing them crimes. Hop out and shoot. Roll one up for the gang. He's not using gang colloquially. The evidence will show he's telling you they are a gang. Okay, so again, that's part of the prosecution's opening statement. Then we heard from the defense. Let me clarify that a bit. We heard some of the defense opening statement from one attorney. Obviously, with the delays in court, that is not surprising. In day two, we will hear more from the opening statements from the other defense attorneys representing other clients. But here we have defense attorney Max Shart, who is representing Shannon Stillwell. Stillwell is accused of not only RICO, but other charges, including murder. Now, Shart talks about Stillwell's past, trying to be a rapper, struggling to make money to fund that rap dream, and how he ultimately entered the drug trade. But, and this is very important, Shart says what Stillwell was doing was to benefit himself, not YSL. 
the state has alleged in their over acts, okay, these are acts that they claim prove that there's some RICO conspiracy afoot. You'll hear that on August 23, 2013, Jen was charged with possession of marijuana with intent to distribute approximately one ounce over 10 years ago. And you'll hear, hear that he pled guilty and did his time. You'll hear that in September 25th of 2019, he was arrested and charged with possession of a firearm. And he took responsibility and he did his time. We're not hiding from the fact that Shannon Stilwell has low drugs. We're not hiding from the fact that he's been found in possession of marijuana. We're not hiding from the fact that he's been found in possession of a firearm, which is always synonymous with selling drugs. <coughs> these, are his, these are his path, his past, his truth, and they were his decisions. His motivation was to make money for him to live, to pay rent, to eat. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not hiding from the past. But the evidence will show that Shannon's decisions, starting over 10 years ago, had nothing to do with YSL or any other organization. You won't hear evidence that Shannon was selling marijuana and then calling someone from YSL saying, hey, I got some money to, to support the organization. Or calling Jeffrey Williams and saying, hey, I got some money for you, man. No. It was for him. He was a drug dealer. He pled guilty. He did his time. That is an important theme, trying to distance yourself away from the alleged gang. Talking about important themes in this case, this for the defense, I imagine we will hear that more from other defendants. Now, Sharp also focused upon the state's case and particularly the murder charges and how informants cannot be trusted, that they are looking to make deals and say whatever they have to say to prosecutors and to law enforcement to make that happen. And he highlights one particular situation that is very interesting concerning the murder of Donovan Thomas. Detective Thorpe is the Atlanta Police Department detective that was assigned this case in January 2015. And you'll hear that he, that he gathered the evidence from the crime scene. There was no DNA. There was no fingerprints of value. And there were no eyewitnesses on January 10, 2015. On October 19, 2015, nine months and nine days after the Donovan, Donovan Thomas shooting, a man named Nicholas Robinson was arrested on the streets of Atlanta, brought to Fulton County Jail for various pending charges. And you will hear evidence that Mr. Robinson decided he needed help. And we'll hear that he contacted Atlanta Police Department and got in touch with Detective Thorpe. And Detective Thorpe came out in an interview with this Nicholas Robinson. That Nicholas Robinson told Detective Thorpe that he saw it all. And he saw the people that were inside the car. And he gave names. Nicholas Robinson said, I saw Antonio Sledge. He came out of the sunroof shooting. I saw Kenneth Copeland. He was in the front passenger seat. I saw Demikion Garlington. He was the driver of this car. But near his Zachary, he wasn't there, but he supplied the gun to Antonio Sledge. And yes, I saw Shannon Stilwell, my client in the back passenger side shooting a handgun. You'll see, you'll learn that during this interview with Nicholas Robinson, it wasn't only Detective Thorpe, there was another investigator there, an investigator Gaither. And while Detective Thorpe was talking to Nicholas Robinson, Detective Gaither was doing some investigation of her own and looking into Nicholas Robinson and who this guy was who had just been arrested. And after 
Nicholas Robinson picked out all these people, including my client. Detective Gaither had to tell Detective Floyd a little secret. Detective Gaither had to tell Detective Thorpe that guy in there that just signed those photo lineups that just found our case. His name isn't really Nicholas Robinson. He lied to us about his name. His name is actually Spencer Wright. So, case was solved by someone who lied about their name. So, what was Detective Thorpe's solution? Well, this is what the evidence will show. Detective Thorpe completely overlooked the lie about the name. And he said to Nicholas Robinson, or he said to Spencer Wright, Oh, uh, yeah, I, I've come to learn that your name is not actually Nicholas Robinson, it's Spencer Wright. Would you look at these photo lineups again? And instead of writing a fake name, Nicholas Robinson, could you actually sign it your real name, Spencer Wright? And Spencer Wright did. The surveillance video that you will see, it's interesting. And know who's in the barber shop, know who's in the park bench, the bus, Marta bench, across from the barber shop? No one. It was all fabricated. It was all made up. It was all a lie. Those are some interesting points right there. Now, remember, of course, opening statements, what the attorneys say here, it's not evidence. It's just a roadmap, a guide, a preview of what to expect in this trial. We'll see what the exhibits and witness testimony tell us. But for now, there you have it. That is day one. Can't wait to see what happens in day two. That's all we have for you here on Sidebar, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. Speak to you next time.